Okay, everybody yep. see that all right? Great. Okay, well, thanks for inviting me to talk to you today. Um, I, I don't know how much I'm going to have to say about consciousness, but uh, yes, in the, in the hopes that uh, an action is somewhat related, uh, overlapping topics of consciousness, maybe, maybe we'll touch on some interesting things. But um, what I want to do today is talk a bit about a long-term research program that's aimed at elucidating the theoretical foundations of the inactive approach. So the inactive framework was first put forward in a 1991 book um, by Varela, Thompson, and Roche, and it has since proliferated in many, many different directions. It's now considered one of the E's of the four E approaches uh, in cognitive science. And it was really founded on, on sort of two key ideas, autonomy and this notion of inaction. Um, but these ideas are actually generalizations of some prior ideas um, from earlier work by Maturana and Varela on autopoiesis, where autonomy is a kind of generalization of autopoiesis and inaction is kind of a generalization of what they called structural coupling. And these two concepts, autopoiesis and structural coupling, can roughly be thought of as some ideas about how to bridge uh, the gaps between physics chemistry on one hand and biology in the case of autopoiesis and biology and cognition on the other hand in the case of structural coupling. And so I'm mostly going to be talking about uh, autopoiesis and structural coupling, but I'll have a few things to say about an action at the end. Okay. So unfortunately, at least to someone like me, these, these very intriguing frameworks of biology of cognition and an action are almost entirely verbal frameworks. Okay? Uh, and this is just a word cloud of a sample of some of the vocabulary that enters into discussions about an action. And again, for someone like me, I find these kinds of discussions uh, not as precise as I would like because they aren't grounded in, in something more formal than, than words, okay? So, so the motivation behind what I'm gonna be talking about today is really trying to explore the question of how might we more precisely formulate the underlying theoretical structure of an action and the biology of cognition frameworks. Okay. So I have sort of a standard research strategy for uh, taking often verbally expressed frameworks and trying to flesh them out a little more theoretically. And it basically goes like this. Um, you select some theoretical framework. In our case, it's going to be the biology of cognition and an action. And you start developing toy models of this framework. Uh, simplified models, toy model in the sense of, of theoretical physics, simplified models that try to engage with some subset of the ideas uh, expressed verbally in that framework. And then you build theories, by which I mean actually mathematically expressed formalizations of these toy models. You can't build theories of, of words, so you have to have this toy model as kind of a, an intermediate bridge. And because these theories are mathematically expressed, you can actually calculate the consequences of these theories. And then based on the results of such calculations, you evaluate the utility of this, of this operation. And that evaluation can then feed back to refine various levels of this strategy. So for example, if the theory you build incorrectly uh, describes the behavior of the, of the toy model, then you're going to have to revise your theory. Maybe some assumption that you made that went into it is not valid in the toy model. Uh, if your toy model, as you further explore it, fails to capture some key features of the theoretical framework it was designed to explore, then you may have to come up with a new toy model. Okay, toy models are not given a priori. They're an act of creation to try to sort of take a slice through something very complicated and try to uh, capture certain features of that complicated thing while at least temporarily suppressing others. And then as you build these theories and explore these toy models, you also may go to the point where, you know, this theoretical framework doesn't really accomplish what I thought it did. Okay? So you may have to go back and revise the framework itself. And so it's within this context that I'm going to uh, explore a toy model of the biology of cognition 
slash in action. And that toy model is sort of built around, uh, it's, it's really a toy model of an emergent individual. Okay? So the idea basically is to, uh, is to explore the, these, these notions of biology of cognition and in action um, in, a, in a universe that's much simpler than our own. Okay? And I'm not going to be arguing that this simplified universe is a very good model of our physical universe. But what I am going to try to suggest is that working through what we mean by all of these verbal notions in a very uh, ideally formal, in some cases formal, in other cases pseudo-formal way, um, in this simplified universe is going to help us build intuition and, and get a deeper understanding of what some of the claims actually are and how well they hold up. So the particular uh, model universe that I've used for this work is Conway's Game of Life, Cellular Automata. And I'm gonna think about this as a kind of physics. That wasn't how Conway thought about it, but that's how I'm going to think about it. So we have a two-dimensional lattice of zeros and ones um, whose time evolution is described by a single universal law that's local in both time and space. And as we all know, this Conway physics, as I'll be referring to it, generates rich pattern forming dynamics. And everything that happens in this universe ultimately derives from this single law. Let me get my laser pointer here. Okay, for some reason I'm not, it's not showing up. So I will just, can you see my mouse pointer? No, okay. Nope. Um, isn't laser, the laser pointer under annotations? Oh, well, I guess it's not going to work. Sorry. Um, so anyway, um, the idea is that uh, we have this physics and everything that we're going to study about this system, we can ultimately trace back down to this physics. But because we have this rich pattern forming dynamics, there's lots of other layers of interesting structure that arise even in this extremely simple uh, physics. So in particular, it turns out that it's straightforward to derive, it's straightforward to divide, derive a simple spatial chemistry uh, that this physics supports in which we think about the universe as being filled with, uh, with processes that are, uh, that are basically triggered by local arrangements of components in, in, the, in the physical universe and that come together uh, using various reaction rules to produce new local arrangements of components. And these processes can be divided into different groups. Um, uh, in particular, I show five here in the table. There's a null process. There's a production. There's a set of production processes, uh, the, the uh, destruction processes, and then maintenance processes that occur. I'm not going to talk very much about the physics or the chemistry here, although there's some really interesting things you can do just with the physics and chemistry of this system. Um, for example, you can do some statistical mechanics um, on this Conway physics, independent of what I'm going to do with it. But what's interesting to me is this, uh, this spatial chemistry then turns out to support uh, self-sustaining and self-individuating networks of processes that I'm going to argue constitute emergent individuals, okay? And these emergent individuals in turn can engage in uh, sequences of very rich interactions with their environments, which I'm going to refer to as behavior. And each of these things right now are just words. I have to back up each of the statements I'm making, which is going to be basically the bulk of this talk. In particular, I'm going to try to walk you through this sequence of ideas using selected results from this research program. And I'm gonna skip many of the details, um, but I'm happy to get into those details in the discussion um, based on your interests, okay? 
So I'm going to start with this idea of an emergent individual, uh, or what's often referred to in this literature as constitutive questions, the constitution of individuals. Hi. And that basically Hi. So maybe that you can use the the annotate from the Zoom and you can use the arrow like this. Can you see the arrow? Yeah, nope. just a second. Let me let me try that. Annotate. Annotate and arrow. Can you can you see? No. Yeah, it just for some reason it's not showing up. Okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Um right. Okay, go ahead. So, okay. so I'll just try to, yeah. Anyway, um, so the idea in the biology of cognition framework and to some extent the inactive framework is that uh, emergent individuals are an instantiation of what uh, Maturana and Varela turned autopoiesis. So autopoiesis is a neologism um, that comes from the Greek root auto meaning self and poiesis meaning creation. So it literally translates as self-creation. And the basic idea behind autopoiesis is that an autopoietic system is a network of processes of production of components that satisfy uh, two requirements, two constraints called self-production and self-distinction. So the self-production idea is that this network continuous of this network of processes continuously regenerates and realizes the network that produces those components. And the self-distinction idea is that uh, this network of production of components constitutes the system as a distinguishable entity in the domain in which they exist. These words are taken from Maturana and Varela's writings. Um, and one of the first things I had to do in this line of work was try to take those somewhat complicated and obscure phrases and turn them into something that you could actually apply to a physical system like this toy physics. Um, but the basic idea illustrated visually here in the bottom of this slide is that you've got some bounded system whose operation in space and time generates a network of processes. And those processes produce components that determine, that constitute, that make up that bounded system. Okay, so you've got this sort of circularity. Um, and the first question I looked at in this work was how might you apply that idea to, um, to the game of life physics, to the Conway physics. Okay. So I, now I don't know how well movies are gonna work. And does that actually show up as an animation or just a flickering? Okay, good. So, so this is an example of what's known as a glider in Conway's game of life, highlighted in sort of the brownish colors against the background of other activity. And uh, this is clearly a bounded thing. Okay, it maintains its spatial coherence. It maintains that coherence over time. And the thing I'm going to be interested in is in what way might we be able to say that this illustrates uh, the notion of autopoiesis, okay? So if you follow a glider for a little bit, you'll notice that it basically goes through a sequence of four transformations. Uh, after that fourth step, it comes back to exactly the same form, but it's offset diagonally um, by one grid cell in the game of life, okay? Now I'll point out that what I'm calling a glider is actually not what is called a glider in traditional uh, game of life uh, literature. That is, I'm including not just the five uh, on cells, but also the surrounding off cells. And there's a reason for that, uh, a technical reason, which I'm happy to get into in a discussion if people care. But for now, I just want to point out to you that I'm doing that and I'm doing it for a reason. So if we look at this canonical four cycle of, of structural transformations in a glider, and we, we shift to the sort of chemistry view of things, and we look at what processes constitute uh, this structure, and I'm gonna add them now also to the four cycle, so that we see that basically each local arrangement of components uh, in any stage of this four cycle uh, triggers a set of processes through the chemistry, which produces a new arrangement of components, 
which in turn triggers a set of processes and so on until you go all the way around the loop. And one thing that's interesting is that uh, even though structurally a glider is offset diagonally by one cell um, after we go around this force cycle, the exact same set of processes are re-triggered after that four steps. Okay, so let me just take you through. I'm going to try one more time because it would be really helpful to be able to point to things. I think I may know what the problem is. Can you see that pointer? Yes, okay. Um, the problem is I've got two screens and I'm looking at one and the, the actual presentation's on another. Okay, so if you'll pay attention to this configuration right here, I want to take you through this idea just once just so you see what I'm getting at. So um, here is a local arrangement of components uh, highlighted in blue here. If we look up in our chemistry, that triggers a particular production process, which is highlighted here. That production process takes a cell that is currently off and turns it on when that process executes. And that new one cell in turn uh, plays a role in uh, nine other processes in this next stage. So if we, if we make explicit the connections implied by what I just walked you through, what we can say is that this process serves to enable uh, these nine other processes. It doesn't uniquely enable them because other things also have to be enabled, but it plays a role in enabling those nine other processes. So if you trace out all those enabling relations among all the processes in this four cycle, then what you basically come up with is what I call the glider organization. It is a set of interdependencies between all the processes that play a role in the glider four cycle. And I've just simplified them here. So this blue node represents a production process, but it doesn't show which one, because to show that this just gets to be a much more complicated diagram. But underlying that is the full structure that I've partially shown here. Okay. All right, so um, this process that I just went through of sort of extracting uh, not what's called an operationally closed organization by tracing these process dependencies in the spatial chemistry is something that can be done for any bounded um, entity, any, any emergent individual in the game of life. And I don't see any reason why you couldn't do the same thing in other cellular automata, although, although the details would certainly be quite different. So to briefly summarize what we've done so far, what I've tried to suggest to you, again, I'm skipping lots of details, that something like a glider in the game of life is a bounded system that generates a network of processes whose extraction I've just sketched for you that produces a set of components that in turn constitute the bounded system of the glider. Okay. So uh, normally the way this is drawn uh, is that you also show there are you also show that there are inputs, there are flows through this closed loop. And that captures two aspects of, uh, of emergent individuals. One is their dependence on an external flow of matter and energy. That is, it captures thermodynamic dependencies. Those do not play a role in the game of life in Conway physics. So this is not a thermodynamically realistic model of physics. And that's something we can talk about more. Um, but the other thing that this flow captures is that even though this is considered to be an organizationally or operationally closed system, um, it's still open to interactions with its environment. And that is true of gliders in the game of life, as I will uh, explain momentarily. Okay. Um, there is another whole story that, that I could tell. Um, I've done some work on the origin of gliders, basically trying to look at an analog of the origin of life problem. How do these kinds of closed operation, operationally closed networks arise from random initial conditions? Um, but I'm not going to get into that here, given the time 
limitations, but I have some slides if we want to talk about that later. So what I do want to talk about is this notion of interaction that I just introduced. Okay, so I'm going to split this into two halves uh, to simplify things a little bit. The first step is going to be looking at the effects that the environment has on one of these emergent individuals. So I'm going to think of these as perturbations, which is the way they're thought of in the biology of cognition. So if we look at the structure of gliders, there's actually um, 16 different structures that you can observe, uh, which are basically just going to be rotations or reflections of two uh, core structures, which I name the wedge and the rocket because of the way the, the one cells look to me when I first started thinking about this, okay? So let's forget about all of those and just focus on the wedge and the rocket. Whenever we distinguish a glider from its environment, we sort of leave behind a glider-shaped hole in the environment, okay? And that glider-shaped hole is bounded by a set of cells that I call the one environment, because it's basically, uh, well, it's a radius of one from the glider that we've just carved out of the environment. And there are 24 such cells. So those cells have two to the 24th possible configurations, okay? So all the interactions that a glider, let, let me be careful. All of the perturbations that a glider can receive from its environment have to come through those 24 cells. Anything outside of that, range doesn't directly impact the glider. It can only indirectly impact it by impacting this one environment. Okay. So we think of these configurations of the environment as serving as perturbations to the glider. I've just shown you a glider operating completely in isolation. Okay. But what we're looking at now is what happens when that glider is in a non-empty environment. Well, two things can happen. One is it can receive a destructive perturbation. So there are some configurations of the one environment that will destroy the glider, that disrupts the underlying operationally closed network of processes and leaves behind just the physics or the chemistry. There's no more operationally closed or emergent individual. Other possible one environments uh, preserve the glider's existence, but they may change its structure in some way. Okay, so this is not the normal next state that you would see from a wedge glider, a wedge structure in this configuration. This glider has been perturbed by the presence of these, of this local environment, but it still preserves the network of processes. It's still a glider um, operating. Okay, so the idea of the next step is going to be to systematically study the consequences of all two to the 24th possible one environments, uh, perturbations that a glider can be subjected to. Okay. And when we do that, uh, we find, uh, not surprisingly, given the sort of very discrete nature of the Conway physics, that the vast majority of those perturbations are destructive. They destroy the glider, they disrupt the glider organization. But maybe somewhat surprisingly, a little less than 100,000 of those two to the 24th perturbations are non-destructive. That is, they preserve the glider organization while possibly changing the glider structure. And what's even more surprising is that of those roughly 100,000 uh, non-destructive perturbations, their consequences, their effects all fall into one of six classes. Okay. And I've color coded the classes just to conveniently label them. So I'm going to refer to things like a brown perturbation, by which I simply mean uh, a wedge subjected to a one environment that causes that wedge to transform into a rocket with this structure. Okay. Likewise, uh, there, are, there are black, blue, and orange perturbations to wedges that produce a different structure that but still preserves the glider organization. And for the rocket form, there are what I'm referring to as gray and green classes of perturbations that change the structure but do not disrupt the organization of the, uh, of the glider. So for example, uh, every 
local one environment that falls into the brown class, and there are many of them, I'll get to that in a second, this isn't just one, but anyone that falls into the brown class will transform a wedge in this configuration to a rocket in this configuration. And that's true for every reflection and rotation, right? So we're covering all these different structural variations bases uh, in the same brown uh, class and likewise for the other classes. Okay. So it turns out, and again, I'm not going into the details here, but we can actually, uh, in, in fact, mathematically from the physics and chemistry derive the structure of these classes. Um, so each of the classes, these four apply to wedges, these two apply to rockets, and I'm just showing you the colors. Each of the classes has, uh, let's look at the brown one. So certain cells have to be on in the one environment, certain cells have to be off, certain cells can take on any value, and certain cells have a constraint uh, between them that limits what values they can take on, but they're not unique. There's more than one assignment of values here, okay? And you can derive a set of equations that completely characterize that set. And among other things, you can count how many solutions there are to those equations. So for example, the brown one I was referring to, there are 8,192 one environments that fall into the brown class. There are 34,000 and some that fall into the orange class and so on, okay? Also, interestingly, um, this derivation that you do to define these classes, it shows how they're all grounded in the glider organization itself. It has to do with the way the glider operates as an emergent individual and the constraints that are implied by all those process dependency arcs that these particular subsets of the local environment are grouped in the way that they are. And I can take you through that if you want uh, it later. Okay, those are individual perturbations, but of course, uh, we're interested in how this unfolds over time. So a glider is going to experience a sequence of perturbations until it encounters a destructive perturbation, at which point it ceases to exist. And we can't talk about perturbations to that glider anymore if it's no longer around. So that just means that the two diagrams I showed you earlier are going to iterate. Uh, they form a branching structure in, in this tree-like notation where I started with just one configuration at a root. And there are all these paths of possible sequences of perturbations that a glider can be taken through by its environment, okay? So the next question we can ask is, uh, we've characterized each of these individual classes of perturbations that gliders can survive. Can we characterize the class of all possible sequences of perturbations that gliders can be carried through by repeated exposure to their environment? And indeed you can. So uh, this shows a schematic map of, uh, of that. Uh, maybe it's better to zoom in on a piece of it to see what we're actually doing. So each of these nodes represents a particular configuration of a glider in its environment. And each of these uh, arcs are colored based on, uh, so for example, I don't think I have a brown perturbation fully in this picture. So let's look at a uh, green one here. If you're in this configuration and you encounter any member of the green perturbation class that will drive you into this configuration. And if you encounter a gray and so on, okay. Um, some of these, are forced. So if you're in this configuration, you can only survive a gray perturbation. Otherwise you disintegrate. But in other configurations like this one, you can survive if you encounter either a gray or a green perturbation, but depending on which perturbation you receive, you will turn into a different structure, which will, as we see, consequently affect how you respond to future perturbations that you receive from your environment, okay? Now, um, this graph I've shown you so far, which I'm gonna call the glider interaction graph, uh, right now it's just a glider perturbation graph, but it will turn into an interaction graph when we look at the, the opposite 
side of the story as well. This shows everything mapped out basically to one spatial offset. So if you start a glider at one place in the environment and you look at all the perturbations that result in it moving one cell in any direction, this is the graph you get. Okay. If you carry that out to two cells in any direction, then you basically get a bigger graph that contains within it, shown in red here, this one-step graph. And if you push it out one further, you get a bigger graph that contains within it the two-step graph, which in turn contains within it the one-step graph. So basically this interaction graph, because we're distinguishing between different uh, embeddings of the glider in the universe, this, uh, this glider interaction graph will expand to fill the entire universe. Okay. So it's infinite if your universe is infinite, it's bounded if you are using periodic boundary conditions. That makes it kind of unwieldy to work with. And it really doesn't, it makes it harder to capture that the fact that there's an underlying structural pattern that's repeating here. And so uh, one way to pull out that underlying pattern is to uh, take that graph modulo some symmetries. And the most useful one I found personally is the one shown here, which is that graph modulo translation symmetry. So we basically don't, we divide out, if you will, all the translational motions here, uh, no matter where a wedge in this configuration sits in the environment, we're always going to represent it with exactly one node. Okay, And you can always leave that uh, configuration in four different ways, uh, brown, orange, black, and blue. Okay, So this gives us a nice uh, compact picture of the underlying structure, which just gets unfolded when you take into account all the different translational embeddings of this. If you wish, there are other symmetries that you can also apply to collapse this further. So if we take the, the interaction graph modulo, not just translation symmetry, but also rotation and reflection symmetry, then we basically get this graph which just highlights the point I made earlier that there are only fundamentally two different configurations that the glider can take on if you divide out all the symmetries, the wedge form and the rocket form. And all the different perturbation classes just move you between those two different forms. If you don't take into account the, reflect, the, uh, the chirality or the orientation of the embedding. Okay. All right. So, so far what I've done is uh, I've, I've sketched how you can use the idea of autopoiesis to define a glider as an emergent individual. And I've studied the consequences of perturbations by the environment on the glider. Now what I wanna do is consider the other half of that story, which is basically two-way interaction between an emergent individual and its environment, not just the environment driving the state transitions of the individual, but also the, the individual driving partially the state transitions of the environment. And that is what the idea of structural coupling is all about. So uh, the basic idea is that when gliders exist in non-empty environments uh, and they persist for some time, like this one undergoes one, two, three, four, five non-destructive perturbations, before finally receiving a destructive perturbation and disintegrating, okay? And these are what you might consider natural sequences of perturbations, by which I mean the following. Previously, I could have followed any perturbation by any other perturbation because I was externally controlling the one environment of the glider. But the actual environment of a, of a glider has to respect the same Conway physics that the glider does, which means that not every one environment can follow every other one environment. It's only the ones that can lawfully follow one another according to the Conway physics. So this sequence of perturbations is not one I've selected. It's one that follows from this initial condition of the glider and the environment. And that's what I mean by natural behavior. Okay. So when you have this two-way interaction, of course, which we can highlight like this, 
it's not just that the environment acts on the glider, the glider also acts on the environment. And what we've done so far, I've shown you how we can sort of break that in half. And I've characterized this half of the story in the glider interaction graph. But what we need to do now to complete this picture is do something like an environment interaction graph that talks about how the environment undergoes state changes and how those state changes depend on the state of the glider. Okay, does that make sense? So that's our next step. Again, each of these, there's a lot of detail to it. I'm just going to jump to the punchline. Um, I'm going to assume that we are in periodic universes, so everything is finite. And what I want to do is just show you the simplest possible universes. Uh, so a glider, it turns out, can actually exist in smaller than a five by five universe, uh, but only by having parts of its boundary share cells with other parts of its boundary. So the only way that a glider can exist independently um, is in a, uh, the smallest universe in which that's true is a five by five universe. And in such a universe, this white area is the glider and there are only three non-glider cells in the universe, okay? And we can map out all possible transitions that three cells can undergo uh, if we color them uh, a, a um, wedge trigger transition, I'm going to color dark red, and a rocket trigger transition, I'm going to color green. And because now we're thinking of the entire universe, um, this graph, which is the environment interaction graph for this universe, is does not have any dissymmetries divided out at the moment. Okay, so this represents all the different ways we can embed these three environment cells into a five by five universe. It is possible, and in the paper I go and do this, you can also take uh, this graph modulo various symmetries and boil it down to a simpler structure, but I'm not gonna get into that detail here. If we go to a six by six universe, then we have more environment cells and we have a more complicated array of environment interaction graphs. One thing that's interesting is from six on, the environment interaction graphs are disconnected. There are different components to the graph that don't overlap. And you'll see things like this. So there's a multiplicity where there may be two different, um, two di fundamentally different inter environment interaction graphs that have the same form but they're non-commensurate. You can't line up the uh, components inside them. And then they can be embedded in 288 different ways into the environment. So that's what these numbers represent. And you can go on with this. This is a seven by seven periodic universe. Um, it has, let's see, just, so it has 27 environment cells. It has, let me see if I can do something here. Okay, it has uh, 27 environment cells. It's got over 213 million nodes and 133 some million edges. And it's disconnected with uh, almost 81,000 components that fall into one of 740 classes. Okay. Um, but the point, the point is simply that the following. For sufficiently small universes, we can completely calculate the environment interaction graph. And for larger universes, we can calculate the environment interaction graph up to some time limit of interest. So for example, if we're interested in tracking the behavior of a glider through its environment interactions, we only need the environment interaction graph up to the time horizon where the glider disintegrates. So you don't need to know anything that's happening outside of that light cone, basically, because those parts of the universe never have any impact on the glider and the glider never has any impact on those parts of the universe. So even in larger uh, settings, you can still calculate this. You just can't calculate it exhaustively. So now we have a glider interaction graph and the environment interaction graph, and we can put these two things together. And that is basically what structural coupling is, okay? So if I show you, okay, so here is a portion 
of the glider interaction graph. I'm not showing you the whole thing. And here is a portion of an environment interaction graph. Again, I'm not showing you the whole thing. Okay. If we put these two together, that is we put this glider in this environment and we designate some starting conditions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start here with the glider in this configuration and the environment in this configuration. Then what happens is this glider, sorry, this environment configuration causes this glider to make a transition here. And this glider configuration causes this environment to make a transition here. So they, they each select among the possibilities of the other a particular transition that they trigger. And then you're in the environments in a new configuration, the glider is in a new configuration, and this process continues until we get to a configuration where the glider, even though it has, in this case, four possibilities for continued existence, the environment isn't in a state that falls into any of those classes. So this becomes a destructive perturbation and the glider ends. So anyway, if you couple these two things together, then what you get is what we can call a glider life. That is a sequence of non-destructive structural transformations uh, or interactions with its environment that preserves the glider organization up to the point where a non a destructive perturbation is encountered and then the glider disintegrates. The notion of its environment no longer makes any sense and the physical environment just continues to follow the Conway physics. Okay. So um, I, I keep widening the scope here. Now, once we have this notion of a, so we've characterized these, in, these interaction graphs for the glider and the environment. Uh, now we have this notion of a glider life. We can ask ourselves, what are all possible glider lives that can be realized in a universe, in a Conway physics universe of a given size? So for the five by five periodic universe, it turns out there's only uh, one class and there are 20 different instances of this class, which is basically um, an immortal cycle. So the glider just keeps running around this periodic environment forever. That's the only possible life in a five by five periodic universe for a glider. In a six by six periodic universe, there are uh, 24 different um, immortal lives that a glider can live, each of which now has some non-trivial transient structure to it before it falls into this sort of immortal cycle. There's also a number of um, terminal lives that undergo a sequence, it's a very short sequence here, of life, of transitions before uh, that glider dies, before it disintegrates, before it encounters a perturbation it cannot uh, compensate for. In the seven by seven universe, there are 28 immortal lives with a much richer now transient structure to it. There's actually 28 double glider immortal lives. So this is where a pair of gliders coexist forever in the same seven by seven universe. And then there are a whole bunch of very intricate uh, terminal lives only two of which I'm showing you here. There are actually 392 classes of glider lives uh, in a seven by seven universe, um, only four of which I'm showing you here. And notice how as the universe gets bigger, the lives get longer and more intricate, which makes sense, okay? Again, we can't exhaustively characterize all possible glider lives in in larger and larger universes, but we can certainly characterize pieces of uh, possible glider lives. For example, if we make some assumptions about the kind of starting conditions that the glider uh, starts from. Okay. There's one other thing we can kind of do uh, just because we can, and it's the sort of broadest possible scope of analysis. In the case of the five by five universe, we can actually look not just at all the possible lives that a glider can live, but we can look at all possible histories of that five by five universe. Okay, so these are not just uh, glider lives, although the glider lives are embedded in this graph. These are all possible histories 
of a five by five Conway physics universe with the multiplicities underneath. This one is just shown schematically because it contains almost 34 million vertices. And this is the history that ends with the empty universe, which is an enormous attractor in the Conway physics. Okay, all of these other things end in non-empty universes of various sorts. Okay, we can now look at where the possible glider lives fit into this all possible histories of a five by five periodic Conway physics universe. Remember the only possible kind of glider life in a five by five universe was the immortal cycle and it's right there. This is the immortal cycle. This is the only one of these components that ever exhibit a glider. One thing that's kind of interesting here, uh, which I'm going to return to at the very end, is that um, we we can we sort of have two different ways we can look at this thing I've shown you so far. We can look at this by focusing here on just this part as a glider confronting its environment, but we can also look at this as just the Conway physics unfolding completely deterministically, completely according to its single universal law. Okay, and those are two completely equivalent perspectives that we can take on this model system. So to summarize this part, uh, I've basically shown how given uh, uh, a definition of a glider as an emergent individual, we can characterize its graph of interactions with its environment. We can also characterize the graph of interactions of an, the environment of a glider through structural, coup structural coupling, we can plug these two things together in various ways, depending upon how we start the situation up, to characterize the structure of all possible lives that gliders could live in uh, any given size universe. Okay, I have, I believe, just one more thing. Um, I have, I don't know, it's about 10 of 10 of 10 here, 10 of wherever, whatever it is there, I can either go through the next step or I can skip it and start wrapping up. Yeah, you can go to, go to the next uh, one okay. more uh, topic. Okay. So, so this concerns another one of these verbal debates in this general area, which often goes by the idea of life-mind continuity. Uh, the basic issue is that Maturana and Varela originally suggested that cognition essentially is an inescapable consequence of autopoiesis. That essentially, whenever you have autopoiesis, or more generally, whenever you have life, you also have cognition or mind. Other people have pushed back on that and said, no, you need life plus something. And what that plus is, is very, very different. There are, there are as many different additional somethings as there are people involved in this debate. Okay, again, from my perspective, I don't find these verbal debates particularly useful. Um, and what I'm interested in doing is now that we have this, this sort of partial toy model theory uh, worked out, what, if any, insight can it provide to this sort of a debate? So in particular, what we have are theories of glider constitution, basically the glider organization, um, and theories of glider interaction, which I'm summarizing here just with the glider interaction graph, but remember, really needs the other part too, the environment interaction graph and the structural coupling. So, so I have a tentative theory of that, uh, of constitution and of interaction. And what I'm interested in is what can I say about the relation between the theory of constitution and the theory of interaction? So this is my attempt to take this life mind, or as I'm fleshing it out, constitution interaction debate and concretize it to this particular toy model and see what additional insights we might get into the nature of the question, okay? So uh, to do that, I have to remedy one limitation of the constitution theory, which I kind of blow blasted through earlier, and that is, strictly speaking, what I have is not the general glider organization. It's what I call the vacuum glider organization. That is, I only build up this network of processes um, in an otherwise empty universe. 
And since this is all about non-empty universes, I need to make sure I have a version of glider organization that holds in non-empty universes. So my first step is to remedy uh, this limitation. And let me show you how the limitation plays out. So here is just a repeat of how I originally derived the, the vacuum glider organization, okay? Now imagine that I turn one cell in this glider's one environment on. Now it's no longer an empty environment, okay? Notice that this set of components now triggers a different process than the one it triggered before. Okay. That means that this whole network is no longer valid because this network includes links that involve this process. But this process has now been replaced by this process in a case where this one environment cell is on. So that kind of invalidates potentially the whole glider organization that I painstakingly derived previously, okay? And I need to remedy that limitation before I could ever talk about what's the relation between the theory of organization, the theory of constitution, and the theory of interaction. However, it turns out, and this is a clue that this is possible to do, if you actually look at what happens when I turn that cell on, it turns out that a glider in this non-empty environment goes through exactly the same sequence of states as the vacuum glider did, okay? So this, along with the fact that we know that gliders can tolerate roughly 100,000 different kinds of perturbations without disintegrating, means there is a more general organization to be characterized, it just isn't as simple as this vacuum organization, okay? I, I'm I've, I've got three people on in front of me and I'm trying to read puzzled looks or nods as everything is okay, you see what I'm doing here? So this is a problem I have to solve, okay? And the way I solved it, again, skipping lots of details, is to generalize the idea of processes to what I call partial processes. The notion is the following, here are four different processes, one from each of the classes, that all share the same four triggering or enabling cells here, but they differ uh, otherwise, okay? And in fact, there are a whole bunch of processes that share those same four cells, but differ other ways. And what I need is a notation to capture this idea of a whole set of processes that have the same effect with respect to the gliders unfolding. And I do that by introducing what I call partial processes. So this is an example of a partial process that can be instantiated with any of these processes, okay? It has these four uh, triggering cells in exactly the same state. That's what characterizes this set of processes. These four cells can take on any value. And this is either going to be what I call a zero maintenance or a production process, depending upon a constraint, which is that the sum of these cells is either equal to one, in which case this will be a production process, or it's not equal to one, in which case this will be uh, what I call zero maintenance process. And that condition just comes from the Conway physics, okay? Similarly, this partial process represents this whole set of processes, depending upon the, the sum of these four cells, okay? So essentially, it, this lets me talk about uh, processes with what you might think of as some don't care conditions, or maybe partially care conditions. These processes are partially constrained, but not fully constrained. And that lets me try and uh, describe sets of processes that might support uh, the continuation of a glider. Okay. Now, in this paper uh, and in a fuller talk on this, there's a number of steps to working out uh, the generalized glider organization by applying this idea of partial processes. I have the slides for that, but I'm gonna skip it for now unless we wanna go back to it and just give you the punchline. 
So what I'm showing you here are all 16 uh, sets of processes that correspond to the 16 different embeddings of a glider. Notice that the boundary of each of these has now been replaced by a partial process. And that's necessitated by the fact that it becomes conditional on the local environment in which we embed this glider. Okay. And then what I've done is I've traced a few of the dependency links between some of the processes like this one and other processes that it enables. And the interesting thing here, let me see. Yes, here, let's look at this one right here. Depending upon the local environment of this process, this process can either trigger these processes, which play a role in this arrangement, or it can trigger this set of processes, which is different from this one, that plays a role in this arrangement. Okay. So what we find, and I, I've only shown selected bundles of dependencies here. I actually haven't had the guts to sit down and compute the full set. Uh, it would be useless as a slide anyway, because it would just be covered with brown. But this gives you the basic idea that when we start with one four cycle, one particular embedding of a glider, we abstract it so that its boundary processes are partial processes to account for the different possible environments. And we retrace all the dependencies. We find that all four possible four cycles, all the four different ways that you can embed a glider are all interconnected in this process dependency network such that you could actually shift, for example, your chirality from the one that, that is operating in this cycle to the one that's operating in this cycle by appropriately embedding this in an environment that perturbs the partial processes in the right way. Okay. So this is what I'm calling the generalized glider organization. And again, I don't pretend uh, that I've explained its derivation fully to you, um, but I hope I've given you a little bit of a sense at least of where it comes from. So basically this network, if you filled in all the dependency relations and extracted that graph, that network is the generalized glider organization. It applies in all conditions that a glider can persist, not just in vacuum conditions. Okay, so now our question becomes, what is the relationship between this generalized glider organization and the glider interaction graph? And again, there's lots of details here, but I'm just gonna summarize to give you the basic idea. Uh, I, I'm going to show you that I can transform the generalized glider organization into the glider interaction graph in with a sequence of steps. Okay. The first step is I'm just going to color all the dependency relations in a visually suggestive way. So all I'm doing is coloring uh, all dependency relations between, say, these two process sets green. Could have colored them anything, but obviously there's a reason for picking that. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, not that uh, it's this between these two or between these two get colored green because these are, they're symmetrically equivalent kinds of transformations. Okay. Likewise, I color various other ones, other colors. Okay. So all I've done is a recoloring. That didn't change anything. The next thing I can do is I can replace each of these sets of processes with the corresponding configuration that generates that set of processes. So that's also an equality preserving. It's a, it, it's, it retains equality, right? Because I can always take one of these configurations and re, rewrite all the processes that that configuration would trigger, okay? So these are both identities. They're just highlighting a certain structure. And the final thing that I can do, and this is not an identity, but it's, it actually still makes the argument I want to make, is that I can take each of these bundles of like colored um, dependency relations and just show them once. So all the green dependency relations between these two just get grouped into two green uh, arrows. Okay, now I think you will notice this looks very familiar. Indeed, I've just shown you that that, oops, sorry, <laughs> that 
this generalized glider organization is basically equivalent in content to the glider interaction graph or said another way because this last thing isn't identity preserving i can derive the glider interaction graph from the generalized glider organization i don't need to map it uh brute force, which is actually how I derived it originally. I literally applied all two to the 24th perturbations to the system and looked at what each one did and then grouped them. You don't have to do that now. If you have the generalized glider organization, you could literally derive the uh, glider interaction graph from it. So to kind of summarize everything that I've tried to show you so far, um, I've talked about uh, at least a partial theory of constitution in this toy model universe, not obviously a, the real physical universe. And I've offered you a, uh, at least a tentative theory of interaction. The constitution theory started with the vacuum glider organization, and then I generalized it to what I called the generalized glider organization. The interaction uh, theory uh, had two parts to it, the glider interaction graph and the environment interaction graph. And then I used a an interpretation of the notion of structural coupling to show how those two things get knitted together into glider lives. And then this last thing I did is I showed you that the generalized glider organization can be used to derive the glider interaction graph. So what does this have to say for life-mind continuity? Well, the following points can be made from this. So one aspect of interaction can be derived from constitution. So there is a sense in which there is a continuity there. There's not a sort of uh, unscalable wall that sits between constitution and interaction or between life and cognition in the, the physical world, which is what's motivating these ideas. But interaction cannot be reduced to constitution because this is only half the story of interaction. The other half is the environment interaction dynamics, and that is not derivable from the glider organization. So there's also something that stands apart about the interaction that isn't equivalent to the constitution. How one wants to interpret that in terms of the verbal debates about life-mind continuity is for someone else to worry about. But I would argue that at the very least, going through this exercise of mapping these connections out in this toy model gives us a little more concrete uh, vehicle for asking these questions and for thinking about for thinking about them. Okay, now I would like to wrap up. I'm not too far over. Um, I want to wrap up actually by not quite wrapping up. I, I've got one more lesson I'd like to very briefly draw. And this is where I'm trying to tie it back to the topic of this series, although I'm not going to talk about glider consciousness. Okay, let me just say that right now. Um, but there is an interesting aspect of subjectivity that arises in this toy model. And that's the last thing I want to just uh, mention. And this is not something I've fully uh, explored. I've just sort of noticed it. Okay. So in uh, the biology of cognition uh, literature and in inaction also, although most of the inactive literature just tends to downplay or forget this, it's still there. The notion of an observer plays an extremely important role um, in these frameworks. Um, basically, observers are the entities that make the distinctions um, upon which our understanding of the world is based, right? So the fact that, that we talk about a world carved up into cities and cars and animals and trees and so on is an act that an observer undertakes in making a distinction and it's uh, our conversations about this sort of shared world um, are possible because of our interactions as observers being able to make this make similar distinctions and be able to share those distinctions through language and so on. This is all Maturana's idea, okay? But the tricky thing is that in some sense, these observers are also the very things that we want to explain. So we have this problem that, uh, in some sense, the source of the objectivity that we share about the world 
is grounded in processes that are themselves embedded in that very world. Yeah. And again, none of this is me. This is all just, this sort of follows from Maturana Varela's ideas. And Maturana especially is extremely explicit about both this role for observers and about the challenge that, that the existence of observers uh, makes for a theory of cognition. How, so my observation starts now. In this toy model universe, we stand in a different relation to that toy model universe than we do to our shared physical reality. By, by construction, we stand outside of the Conway universe. Okay, We are peering in at that universe, and we can adopt an objective perspective with respect to that universe. We can't adopt an objective perspective with respect to our own physical universe because we are embedded within it, but we can adopt such a perspective with respect to the, uh, the Conway universe. And, and pretty much that's what I've been doing this entire talk is playing the objective scientist peering in, in into my little you know, Petri dish universe, uh, doing experiments, um, uh, making observations, writing down theories and so on. But there's one other thing that we might be able to do here. Perhaps it would be interesting to inquire into what might an observer look like that was embedded within the Conway physics. It wouldn't be us, it wouldn't be an observer like we are, but might it be possible, and this is just a question I'm raising, uh, to think about from our objective perspective, what an observer in the universe might, constant, might look like and because we have our objective pers perspective, we can both look at that observer as just the, un the unfolding of the Conway physics or the chemistry, or we can think about its actions as an observer. How is it constituted? What does its interaction graph look like? You know, what, what does it mean to be an observer within this Petri dish universe? So uh, perhaps this might provide an interesting vehicle for thinking about an objective account of at least a primitive kind of subjectivity. And my last non-concluding slide is uh, dangling a little hint about that that might actually be possible. Okay. So to do that, I wanna reiterate this point I made that we've been taking the external observer perspective on this universe, This which I'm showing here the Conway physics, but because of uh, of my reasons for doing all of this in the first place, we've sort of pulled out significant structures from this physics by identifying emergent individuals, identifying their environments, characterizing the interactions and so on. We've done all that from our external objective perspective. But I've already shown you at least a hint that there is at least one other perspective that can be taken on the Conway universe. And that is the perspective of a glider itself. I'm not claiming gliders are observers. That requires more thought about what an observer is. But I do want to point out the following thing. Because a glider can make a distinction, it can distinguish different kinds of environments with which it interacts. In particular, these six different kinds of environments, which I've summarized with colors. Okay. Um, even though we, when we look in from the outside, see all the microstructure, or we can see more macroscopic structure, depending upon how we want to tune our scientific magnification, we can see lots of things that a glider cannot. There are many, many configurations of the environment that a glider cannot experience because it literally kills the glider. Okay. Even among the environments that a glider can survive, it groups a whole bunch of them that look quite different to us all into blue environments. And it groups another bunch of them that all look quite different to us into orange environments, okay? So there is a sense in which a glider has a kind of umwelt, uh, which is this term from von Uxko, which basically just means um, the world as experienced by a particular organism, okay? This is not, 
uh, this way of carving up the Conway universe is not intrinsic to the Conway universe. It doesn't align with our way of carving it up. The glider says two things are equivalent that we would consider to be completely different. And the glider makes distinctions between two patterns that we would think those look almost the same. Okay. But these are significant to a glider because they have consequences for how its behavior unfolds in the environment. Okay. Uh, so again, I'm not arguing that's that's a, an observer, but I am arguing that to the extent that we have emergent individuals and to the extent that you buy the sequence of analyses that I've done, we do at least have a primitive kind of subjectivity or perspective uh, that's taken by an embedded emergent individual on the glider universe. Okay, now I promise I'm summarizing. This is my very last slide and I will be done. So one way of thinking about the basic structure of an action is that it takes uh, a universe, uh, undifferentiated here, and it basically identifies uh, operationally closed subsets of that universe as autonomous things, which form a kind of individual or identity because it operates as a coherent whole. And that uh, identity in turn defines a domain of interactions by virtue of the kinds of things it is and is not sensitive to and can and cannot survive about its external environment, which in turn, I've just shown you, uh, projects a kind of significance onto certain subsets of the physical universe by virtue of its organization as an emergent individual. Okay? And this loop is, is very, very close to the kind of diagram that Varela drew later in his life to summarize the key uh, kind of circularity underlying an action. And what I've tried to do, again, this is not me, this is Varela. What I've tried to do is show you by taking an unbelievably simple toy universe, okay, um, and concretely asking what each of these steps might look like and trying to build theories of those things, um, which you can actually use to calculate uh, things about a system like its domain of interaction, like its organization, um, like its umwelt. These are all calculable things in this sort of theory that I've I've laid out to you. Um, I think this is an example of how one can take what's previously been a purely verbal debate and actually start to take steps to try to concretize it into something that might someday be a legitimate scientific theory. And clearly there's much to be done. There's all kinds of things, which I'm sure all of you are about to point out to me. There are all kinds of limitations about having selected the Conway physics as my toy model universe. Nothing about the overall lessons I'm trying to uh, point out in this conclusion depends upon the particular details of the selections I made. And, and, and I don't wish to defend uh, very far those particular choices, but rather to show a path whereby uh, we can take these very flippery, philosophical, verbally expressed ideas and turn them into something much more theoretically grounded. Uh, much clearly remains to be done. Um, and just as an example, um, I, I was just talking uh, 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 before, before my talk that uh, uh, we have a very recent paper with uh, Ezekiel DiPaolo where we take a concept from an action, namely precariousness. And we try to use this toy model to sort of take apart that concept as to what it might actually mean in different ways you might be able to interpret it. And with that, I'm done. I'm sorry I ran over a bit.